Okay, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here and tell you about our recent work and the new method we developed for conducting genetic association studies. So let's begin with a quick reminder about GWAS. So in genetic association studies, what we want to do is to find links between uh, variants to phenotypes using some kind of cohort data. And specifically in GWAS, what we do is we go through all the variants independently. And for each variant, uh, suppose in the case of a binary phenotype, we split the cohort to cases and controls. And we see whether the allele frequencies of this variant uh, differ between the two groups. Uh, so for example, we can see that the C allele might be more common in cases than in controls. And then we use some kind of routine statistical methods, and we can see whether these uh, associations is significant or not. Uh, now, of course, this is a slight simplification. In real life, we need to account for a population structure and some other complications, but this gives you the gist of the idea, which is actually very simple. And once we do that for all the variants, we get those Manhattan plots that we all know and love, and everything uh, which is more significant than, say, uh, 5e to the minus 7 is considered to be x and y uh, significant. So GWAS has really uh, been very useful over the last two decades and provided many uh, robust associations and a lot of insight into many diseases, uh, but it also has some pretty profound uh, limitations. So first, uh, the loci that are discovered with GWAS tend to be very large uh, because of the problem of linkage disequilibrium, which makes it very hard very often to pinpoint the exact uh, causal variant. Uh, now, also because we test each variant independently, we have a very strong burden of multiple testing, and we lose a lot of statistical power. And this problem is especially grave when we deal with rare and even de novo variants, uh, which GWAS is, for GWAS it's really hard to handle, because if a variant appears only a handful of time in a given cohort, then we will never have sufficient statistical power to detect it. And these days, many actually believe that those uh, rare variants actually amount to quite a lot of the heritability in many uh, complex traits. So it's actually quite important to, to know how to handle them. Uh, now, like most of the time when people use GWAS, they just assume additive uh, genetic effects. Uh, but we know that in many cases, that's not really the case. And for many more complex kind of genetic interactions, it's very hard for GWAS to handle them and detect those associations. And I think the most uh, fundamental and profound limitation of GWAS is that when we do that, we actually have no prior knowledge. We don't know anything about biology. We don't even know that genes exist, which are, of course, uh, the elementary uh, functional building blocks of our genome. So I think a good way to illustrate uh, this last point is to imagine that we have those two heels. So on the one heel, we have genetic variants at the molecular level, which we want to connect to the other heel of phenotypes at the organism level. And in between, we have this vast lake of very complex and intricate uh, connections, uh, which is actually the causal networks uh, that explains how those variants affect the phenotypes, what we might want to call simply biology. Now, modern-day statistics, uh, the dominant approach is simply to ignore all of this biology and to dig a deep tunnel below the lake and try to use brute force statistics to connect the variants directly to the phenotypes. Uh, but it, it can only take you uh, so far if you, if you use this uh, brute force approach. What we suggest to do is to try to incrementally uh, bridge this gap. So as a first step, we might want to take something relatively simple like protein and gene function, which we think we have a good handle on and we know how to model, and to model how variants affect that, and then to look for uh, associations between that to phenotypes using statistics to uh, bridge the remaining gap. So we don't try to model everything in biology, just this little piece, hoping to get us one step further. And we use 
uh, machine learning techniques because we want to make sure that the way we model uh, those variant effects on, on function don't only look nice in theory, but actually work in, with our real world data. So the method we developed is called PWAS, Proton Wide Association Study. And what PWAS tries to do is to find associations between genetic variants to phenotypes, which are mediated by protein function, as opposed to GWAS, which will just look for direct associations. So here we have a, really a bird's eye view of how PWAS works. So it actually gets the same input as GWAS. So we begin with uh, some genotyping data of some cohort. And what PWAS does, it combines this genotyping data with what we call proteomic prior knowledge. So you can think about uh, functional and structural annotations and really any feature that we can extract from public databases uh, that can shed light on what these uh, variants might be doing to the genes we're interested in. And from, these, uh, from this genotyping, together with the prior knowledge, we try to derive what we call protein function uh, matrices. Uh, and we do that using machine learning uh, and modeling, which I will say more about it in the next slide. Um, but essentially what we try to capture is uh, the amount of damage that we believe is caused to each uh, specific gene within each specific individual. So for every combination of gene and individual, we will derive two scores, a dominant effect score and a recessive effect score. The dominant effect score will try to reflect the probability that this individual has at least one damaging variant within the gene, so at least one copy uh, of the gene is damaged. And the recessive effect score will try to capture the probability for at least two damaging uh, variants. And once we have these matrices, uh, we can look at columns of those matrices representing specific genes and to see whether they correlate with the phenotype of interest. And of course, if we want the results to be meaningful, we better account for covariates. So how are the gene effect scores uh, calculated? So to prove that we are very serious and know what we are doing, I put some mathematical formulas here. Uh, but don't worry, I won't have time to go into it, really. OK, so like I said, we use a machine learning model. So we take a variant. Uh, for each variant, we extract uh, many proteomic features, everything we can say about it. And then we use uh, pretty standard uh, machine learning algorithms to try to predict uh, whether this variant is damaging or not to the gene. And then again, for each individual, we aggregate all the variants uh, that affect it together with uh, their uh, predicted effects and we derive those dominant and recessive scores. We try to really capture everything we can say about uh, the function of uh, the specific gene in the context of this individual. So to test the method, we worked on the UK Biobank dataset, uh, which contains uh, 500,000 genotyped individuals, each of which with thousands of traits. Really an awesome data set. And let's begin with uh, a quick case study. So let's consider the MUTY8 gene, which is a known uh, cancer predisposition gene that increases the risk for colorectal cancer. Here you can see the architecture of the gene, and you can see the axons, and you can see uh, specific domains within the gene. And you can see the 47 different variants uh, that are genotyped or imputed in the UK Biobank dataset uh, that actually affect the protein sequence of the gene. And they are color-coded by how much they likely damage uh, the function of the gene according to our model. So what happens when we look at each of the variants individually, uh, the most significant of which will get us a p-value only on the order of e to the minus 3, which is very far from uh, the significance threshold for GWAS. But PWAS, on the other hand, even though it considered the exact same set of variants, it can derive a Q value on the order of e to the minus 6. And notice that this is a Q value, not a p value. And we can actually derive that because PWAS works at the gene level, not at the variant level. And we also see that this is mostly a recessive effect. So to illustrate what PWAS actually captures, uh, you can see the graph here. You can see uh, a partition according to the recessive effect scores 
of the entire UK Biobank cohort. So on the left bar, you can see the 14 cases that have the lowest uh, recessive scores. So these are samples that are like, likely to be hit by uh, at least two damaging variants. And you can see that five out of these 14 samples uh, are actually cases with colorectal cancer, which amounts to about 35% of them. And this is in contrast to the other samples for which it's only about 1%, which are cases. So this is a 35-fold increase. And I will confess that there is some cherry picking in this uh, specific example and the exact uh, threshold that we took here. And also it doesn't account for covariates, but of course when we use PWAS, uh, PWAS knows how to look at the entire distribution, and it also of course considers uh, covariates. Uh, so, so the results of PWAS are actually uh, reliable. Okay, now of course we didn't test only a specific gene and not, of course not just a specific phenotype. We actually considered 50 different prominent phenotypes from the UK Biobank cohort. And for each of the phenotype here, you can see only several of them. You can see in, in brackets, you can see the number of significant uh, genes that we found. And you can see uh, which percentage of them are significant by GWAS in blue or PWAS in red, or both of them, what you see in purple. Okay, and we can actually see that both GWAS and PWAS actually add a lot to the overall signal, and they really complement each other very well. Uh, now, we didn't only test GWAS, we also tested other gene-based approaches, and specifically we tested uh, SCAT. Uh, but unfortunately, I won't have time to show it to you here. Okay, so what are the advantages of, of PWAS? What is, is it good for? Uh, so first of all, uh, it gives you more focused and interpretable uh, results. So when you find a significant association by PWAS, it can actually give you a, a more concrete uh, interpretation of what's actually going on. So for example, you can see that uh, within cases, you have a gene that is more damaged than in controls. Okay, now of course it's not an indisputable proof for a causal link, but I think it does get you uh, one step further uh, towards this direction. Uh, second, because it's a gene-based approach, you have a lower burden of multiple tests. And very importantly, it knows to extract signal from rare and the novel variants, which like we saw, GWAS doesn't know how to handle. But for PWAS, PWAS doesn't care about the specific identity of specific variants. All it cares is what the variants appear to be doing to the gene function. And therefore, it can even extract a, a signal from a variant that appears uh, only a single time and add it to the oral signal that it gets uh, for the entire cohort and see everything in light of the proteomic context of what's actually happening. A specific area in which PWAS, I think, really shines is uh, with recessive effects, uh, which GWAS is especially bad at because uh, even if we did want to model recessive effects with GWAS, it would only work for variants which, uh, sorry, only appear, work in the cases where you have uh, the exact same variant uh, for which you have the recessive effects. But many times we have what is known as a compound, compound heterozygosity, so we have the two uh, copies of the genes are affected, but each of which with a different variant, and GWAS is completely blind to it. But again, like we saw, PWAS doesn't care about the identity, identity of the variants. It can capture the signal just as well as any other. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that PWAS is really useful. And at this point, you must be wondering how you can uh, get your hands on PWAS and use it for your own data. So luckily for you, we've worked really hard in the past few months to outsource PWAS and to put it in GitHub. Uh, you have the link here below. So it's very easy, you can take any data set that you could work with, uh, with Pling or any other uh, genetic software and use it just as well with uh, PWAS. You have very simple command line interface. It's very fast and very efficient and you have very detailed uh, documentation on GitHub. Okay, so to summarize, I've shown you a bio biology-driven modeling uh, method that uses, on the one hand, uh, flexible machine learning techniques, but on the other hand, uh, rigorous uh, statistics. And it gives you very interpretable protein-centric uh, results, which I think are more actionable. And like we saw, it really complements what GWAS and other methods uh, give you, and you can detect more kinds of 
associations, including recessive uh, effects. Uh, now, these days, this work is still under review, which I hope will uh, be finished soon. But meanwhile, if you want to read more, you can fi find a paper on BioArchive, and the title of the paper is actually the same as the title of this talk. So thank you very much for listening, and I want to also thank my two advisors, uh, Michal Lineal and Nati Lineal, and the rest of the Lineal Lab. And finally, I will say that these days I'm really in the process of wrapping up my PhD and starting to think about uh, the future of my career. Uh, so I would be really happy to hear about interesting opportunities. I put my email here below, so if you want to talk about anything, feel free to contact me, really. And with the remaining time, I will be more than happy to take questions.